Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui in Beijing. Twenty years ago, in his book *The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order*, Professor Samuel Huntington from Harvard predicted that all future conflicts, wars, and possibly world wars would be over cultural and religious differences. People's cultural and religious identities would remain the main source of a conflict in the post-Cold War world. The fault lines between civilizations would be the battle lines of the future. Has this become a self-fulfilling prophecy? Will wars be fought more among different civilizations rather than nation states? How do we understand the major conflicts emerging between Islam and the West, and what are the solutions? To address all these issues, I'm joined in the studio by Professor Zhang Xudong with the Department of Comparative Literature of New York University. But before we begin, let's take a look at this background report. Widely deemed as a classic work that will shape political thought for generations, *The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World* was written by the late famous political scientist Samuel Huntington. In this controversial book, Huntington divided the world into seven or eight major civilizations, including Western, Confucian, Japanese, Islamic, Hindu, Slavic Orthodox, Latin American, and African. He predicted that civilization, rather than ideology, would be the major source of conflict in the post-Cold War world. Huntington also argued that civilizational conflicts are particularly prevalent between Muslims and non-Muslims. And suggested that in the future the central axis of world politics would tend to be a conflict between Western and non-Western civilizations. In Kishore Mahbubani's phrase, a conflict between the West and the rest. Since its publication in 1996, the clash of civilizations has triggered broad debate about relations between the Western and Islamic worlds, especially in the aftermath of the September the 11th attacks on the U.S., which were viewed by some as the practical onset. Of the clash of civilizations. Welcome to Dialogue, Professor Zhang. Professor Samuel Huntington drew a lot of fire for the work, uh, the clash of civilizations. A lot of people disagree, saying he has exaggerated the fault lines between the Mao and different civilizations, which he said、uh, could become the major source of conflicts, even world wars. Do you agree? Actually, I was one of those who disagreed very strongly with him 20 years ago when the book first came out. And even before that, when he gave his famous speech at the American Enterprise Institute and then published a famous article in Foreign Affairs, I was among those who were virulently against the book. But 20 years later, 20 some years later, I recognized. I just began to recognize. You have been proved wrong. I thought I was wrong, and he was right,、mm -hmm. um, and for the following following reasons, not because he、uh, advocates. As kind of、uh, the so-called Machiavellian sort of approach、uh, to use force, to yeah. But first, I think I like his realism, just to face the real issues of the world rather than、uh, whitewashing or using euphemisms. That's one I like. The other is that I think he has his fingers on some of the deep-seated conflicts,、uh, the so-called fault line issue. I think he has been proven. Uh, correct, but on the other hand, I think the book has been misread and misinterpreted by his、uh, proponents and the detractors. We can, if we have time, we can address that as well. But first of all, do you have a clear definition about what is a civilization, and do you think China is a civilization state or a nation state? I think it's both. The it's Lucien Pai, a、um, MIT political scientist, who came up with this famous line: "Says China is." A civilization trying to pass as a nation-state. I think that line captures 
the complexity, the ambiguity of China uh, being somewhere between a civilizational state and a nation state. But then, first of all, your definition about the civilization. The, it's a it's a it's a slipper, slippery uh, category, but uh, in a commonsensically, we can talk about civilization as the the largest common denominator uh, uh, of people who see each other as belonging to the same uh, form of life, way of life, value system, language, culture, historical memories. Um, that's why. An Italian and a French may have all the differences in the world, but eventually, by the end of the day, they would see each other as uh, belonging to the same Western civilization. Christianity being one, common history from the medieval uh, Middle Ages, Roman Catholic Church, uh, Reformation, uh, enlightenment, uh, Renaissance, Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution, and, and the list goes on. These shared historical experiences and institutions and religious cultural foundations give birth to, give rise to this widely recognized uh, a boundary of this shared sphere of world which we call civilization. But yet a European scholar argued famously that perhaps uh, those who claim they share the same civilization live in an imagined community. Have you noticed the, 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 the controversial argument? It is uh, it's true. Uh, you can always break down these uh, 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 general categories into an ever smaller uh, uh, categories and concepts. But uh, that does not take the real force away from these shaping forces uh, in the world today, which can sooner or later be traced back to civilizational uh, boundaries. To that extent, I do agree with Samuel Huntington. The immediate concern for an observer like me who work for the media industry has been using politics and the civilizational differences in East Asia as a context to examine what could happen to China politically mm -hmm. during the period of transformation. Everybody is talking about whether China would become yet another democracy or it remains an autocracy based on metocracy. Uh, what would be the main hallmarks uh, to uh, tell the differences between uh, the transformation in China and uh, democratization in other uh, young industries and low-income economies on the periphery of China. Mm. Therefore, East Asia has fast become a very important concept uh, in drawing a line between the West and the East, yeah. particularly in the post-Cold War era, when the United States uh, are so happy dwelling upon the importance of the color revolution and whether China would follow suit to the Arab Spring, color revolutions, and so on and so forth. I think part of the reason why this book is, has been so innovative, uh, regarded as innovative and useful, is that it, it actually problematizes these uh, these uh, Cold War categories and uh, these conventional distinctions, such as the East versus the West. Because uh, if you take this uh, clash of civilizations uh, seriously, you realize that this, uh, Huntington suggests that in East Asia alone there are several civilizational systems, Japan being one. It's not part of the so-called Confucian civilizational sphere. And uh, the Philippines is uh, actually part of the Christian uh, civilizational sphere. That's a very strong Catholic tradition. Exactly. And uh, Indonesia and a part of Southeast Asia, for instance, Malaysia, belong to the, this Islamic civilization. So in East Asia alone, there are at least four different civilizations clashing with each other. That, that's one, uh, that's part of the, uh, the, the sort of the civilizational context in East Asia, which is very, very complicated. That already uh, makes the picture fuller, rather than just be regarding East Asia as one single block, right, dominated by either this or that particular civilization. No, it's a coexistence of several civilizations. And internally, back to China, I think if you recognize Chinese society as a civilizational one, I think that would eventually lend some force, intellectual force, to the argument that this society is rightfully in search of its own uh, historical trajectory, its own social system. What is 
good for this civilizational survival or development or di identity. Uh, it, it goes without saying. It's implicit uh, in this civilizational-based world order or civilizationally-based uh, social development uh, that China should and must seek its own way. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, late uh, founding father of Singapore, said to uh, Americans as well as uh, perhaps uh, to Asians uh, uh, in the neighborhood that uh, most of the Chinese feel very comfortable with having a very strong central government. That's quite beyond the imagination and uh, reason, uh, logic of most of those in the West who argue that democracy is absolutely non-negotiable and should be the only road map for your whatever transformation. What do you think of you know, the differences between the perception shared by most senior politicians in the East and those in the West who argue, the, the, argue for universal uh, values, uh, democracy, free use of a ballot box in deciding the future of a country? Right. I think this is a case in point. Um, showing that this book, uh, The Clash of the Civilizations, has changed the conceptual map of the world, the ways in which people uh, 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 examine these uh, uh, issues. For instance, we just talked about uh, the, the, the concept of civilization uh, would endorse, uh, conceptually at least, uh, China seeking its own way. But on the other hand, it also problematizes this state-based one China model, this nationalist model, because Singapore, for instance, is also part of the Chinese civilization. Nevertheless, it has a different social system, it has a different uh, uh, commercial culture, uh, uh, institution, institutional set, set up. If you look at, the, at these East Asia through the lens of civilizational conflict, and the coexistence, you realize the so-called Chinese civilization has possesses internally multiple modes of production, multiple paths of social development. The competition and the cooperation create such opportunities, which eventually, as uh, Samuel Huntington has predicted, would change the balance of a uh, uh, world power. Uh, and one of his observations, based on his civilizational model, I think, is that the Western moral supremacy or sense of superiority uh, historically is based on the military strength and the technological advantage. As East Asia fast catches up on those fronts, this region, namely East Asia, with Confucian or Chinese civilization at the center of it, uh, will acquire more and more confidence and eventually will be in a place to change the rules. And yet China is currently at the loggerheads with some of the claimants yes. in the South China Sea. Uh, having said this, um, why do you think uh, we failed to see major conflicts between different ethnic groups, particularly between Muslims, uh, non-Muslims, uh, in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia in the wake of the September 11th terrorist attacks uh, in the year 2001. Yet in sharp contrast, in the Middle East, we see the rise of uh, Daesh or ISIL and above all, uh, very radical Islamism uh, in this most volatile region of the Middle East. And uh, such uh, uh, dangerous uh, trends of ideology uh, and ideological violence and sectarian violence uh, threatens to disrupt the social order, uh, the basic principles that share, that shape the European Union, uh, the long war of attacks in France and Germany these days. All of these combined give us a very uh, scary picture that uh, extremism arising from Islam political Islamism uh, might be a major threat to uh, peace and stability in the East, particularly in the West. But uh, let's first of all look at why do we ha have we been able to have a, a relatively harmonious social picture in East Asia. Indonesia uh, boasts of the largest uh, uh, Muslim population in the world. 
ironically, and yet it didn't have any massive anti-U.S. or anti-West demonstrations in the wake of 911. Neither did we have such things in Turkey, which experienced the success of uh, Kemalism uh, at the beginning of last century, mm. despite the failed coup in recent weeks. So you're referring to this phenomenon that the Islam in, in East Asia or Southeast Asia it has been relatively peaceful. Yeah. This book, uh, in this book, Samuel Huntington observes rather darkly that uh, Islam has bloody borders, as simple as that. It's a, based on historical fact or statistics. He drew, draws this conclusion. But you're absolutely right. In Asia, uh, Islam doesn't seem to have uh, as bloody uh, a history as it, it has in other regions of the, of the world. Um, that, I, I'm no expert on, on, on this issue, but back to China, I think uh, this relative harmo harmony you referred to has something to do uh, with uh, the, um, the tradition ever since Chinese enlightenment, this modernization, ob uh, the obsession with modernization, the obsession with a universal trajectory of human development. Uh, um, sanctioned uh, very strongly by the communist state uh, has historically kept the different religious ethnic differences in check. There is a, has been a prevailing universal high culture in place which provides a sort of umbrella uh, uh, overarching uh, a value system. But that has been seriously eroded, I think, recent, in recent decades because of uneven development and because of this uh, uh, increasing self-assertiveness inspired or supported by uh, uh, religious differences and the comp competition, even violence, in the global context. I think China has already begun to face these uh, 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 problems uh, more visible in other parts of the world. Thank you very much. You are watching Dialogue with uh, Professor Zhang Xudong with the uh, Department of Comparative Literature of NYU. We are discussing, in fact, uh, we are commemorating the 20th anniversary of the release of a very controversial book called The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. It was written by Professor Simon Huntington 20 years ago. We'll be back in a short while. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Professor Zhang, let's look at the clashes, very violent clashes between Christianity and uh, Islamism, uh, in, particularly in the Middle East, if not in continental Europe. Uh, we saw terrorist attacks uh, against uh, Jali Abdul in Paris and uh, slaughter of uh, thousands, of, uh, sorry, dozens of people in a theater in Paris and again, uh, the killing of uh, the priest in the French church recently. Now, such things uh, seem to be gaining momentum and dynamics uh, in scale and uh, size. So what do you think of the uh, very serious civilizations? Is that part of the civilizational shifts? Oh, sorry, rifts? Yes. The, the hypothesis of uh, civilizational fault line proposed by Samuel Huntington, he does say that this is a hypothesis. He doesn't say that it's a conclusion, it's a definitive uh, uh, finding or something, but rather a working hypothesis. But this hypothesis helps us to uh, delve deep into the, the issues uh, uh, at hand, which is um, in China, at least in the past decades, people seem to tend to believe that as we continue to modernize, to progress, all these social problems and differences, including identity problems, will be solved by development, by means of development, through development. But Islam and its, its, its current clash with, uh, with the West shows, I think, very convincingly and a very, um, in a very anxiety-causing way that people eventually live by, stand by, and live within their civilizational identity faith, defined in terms of faith or, or otherwise, uh, without willing to sacrifice this fundamental identity uh, for the sake of uh, secular, uh, material uh, well-being. So this is something uh, I think uh, 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 
uh, it should be something new and alarming to uh, Chinese intellectuals and the, and the Chinese people because there's a lot of optimism uh, in the in um, uh, placed within modernization and development. The f a second look at the, some of the uh, areas uh, of ambiguity may help uh, illuminate uh, the uh, conflicting or uh, messy situations in the Middle East. Uh, particularly among the Arab countries and the, the Turks, uh, the Kurds, and so on and so forth. Why did we see the success of Kemalism in Turkey, whilst uh, the in, uh, industrialization, uh, success of which was uh, overseen and engineered by the United States in the Persian state of Iran, was uh, pushed back by the 1979 Islamic Revolution under the leadership of uh, Grand Ayatollah uh, Khomeini. And, uh, and that led to the uh, decline, sharp decline in the relationship between Tehran and Washington because uh, 52 American diplomats were held hostage for 50, 444 days. That's uh, indeed a tragedy, if not uh, something that epitomizes the serious clashes between Christianity and uh, Islamism. What do you think of these two cases? Uh, we have to do some case study to illuminate the differences, right? In Iran, starting with 1979 revolution, and in Turkey, I think these are uh, uh, seminal, seminal cases which uh, uh, indicate the, uh, the resurgence or development, historic, world historical development of Islam, uh, compared to which uh, westernization uh, appears to be relatively short-lived uh, a, a moment eventually to be swamped by this uh, reorientation uh, 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 with, uh, with one's own religious and, uh, and, uh, and cultural uh, uh, traditions and, and identities. Uh, these are, I think, really, really profound world historical developments and we are only uh, scratching the surface of these issues. So our understanding in China as well as in the West uh, is so inadequate and uh, there's so much to be done in that regard. But if I may, I want to turn to um, the one of the um, central, I think, teachings of Samuel Huntington's book, which bears um, uh, significance in today's world. I think, obviously, he wrote this book in the interest of, of America. He was a loyal sort of a warrior for, for American global interests. There's no question about it. But implicitly, I think, and increasingly obviously, uh, if you read the book, you realize he's very critical of American policies. I think his argument is, can, be boil, can boil down to this. Internally, within a country, within a civilization, within a system, you should try to promote integration unity, universal values, which bring people together. Externally, you should realize, you should recognize the fact that the world is cons constituted by different civilizational blocks. And you, if you want to achieve world peace, you have to recognize the, the real foundation of a world order. And for him, the real foundation is the coexistence of fundamentally different civilizational blocks. If you take his teachings uh, seriously and look at American domestic and the foreign policy, it runs just opposite of uh, uh, Huntington's uh, advice. Internally, it tends to promote diversity, multiculturalism, tolerance, and so on and so forth. What, in a well-meaning fashion, it's viewed as progressive, you know, democratic, liberal, and so on and so forth. And there are real benefits uh, of that. But externally, America tends to uh, be the, the, the advocate for a one polar, one standard, kind of a universal world order. Uh, with America being its moral anchor. And that policeman. could be the discourse of American exceptionalism, <laughs> you like it or not. Well, uh, one thing that Professor Sammy Huntington dwells upon in his book, which was uh, completed uh, five years after uh, the Cold War to an end in 1991, 
was uh, it could be a nightmare for uh, Confucianism to join hand with the uh, mm -hmm. Islamic Revolution as opposed to Christianity in the post-Cold War era. While China makes friends with uh, all of the member states of the 22 member Arab League, we are no enemy of any of the major players in this uh, Middle East region. The United States and its military interventionism tends to wreak havoc with uh, uh, the Middle East. Therefore, yeah. President Obama tends to lead from behind <laughs> and lead, to lead by example instead of uh, getting involved directly and militarily in the regional conflict. So, do you think, uh, on the other hand, the, the, com the geopolitical comeback of Russia has added to the dynamics in this process of the geopolitical reconfiguration, fueling the uh, rivalry, if any, between a combination of uh, Islamism, and Confucianism, and Orthodox Church with Christianity? I mean, this uh, could uh, be yet another uh, major scenario. Uh, if not the clashes uh, between different civilizations. Yeah. So this is a very general picture, but it's uh, something that captures the hearts and minds of That's so many right. who follow the process there. Right. That part uh, has to do with his strategic thinking and his practical advice to, say, American Department, the uh, State Department or something. That, f to me personally, is a less interesting part of, of his book. If I remember correctly, he gives us a picture of World War War Three, mm -hmm. um, in which eventually, uh, surprise of all surprises, Japan sided with China, whereas Russia sided with the West. So for him, the fundamental religious differences it will carry the day. So his sort of a momentary speculation of what if this nightmare sort of a scenario, what if uh, Confucian China, uh, civilization teaming up with uh, uh, Islamic civilization? It's, it's, I don't see it's, it as a kind of a likely uh, scenario. China being a secular, materialist, modernizing uh, society might be on the on the, the list of uh, Islamic fundamentalists, I mean, the hit list of, Americ uh, of Islamic fundamentalists as well. I mean, to that extent, China clearly is part of the, of the modern, if not secular, if not Western world, right? That, 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 that for me is... In fact, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region has become target of the East Turkestan Islamic movement. That yeah. is a, listed as a terrorist organization. Um, so you will have strong doubts about uh, such a, uh, a, a combination. I think it's extremely or unlikely. alignment. Yes. Although you, I think your question uh, raised a very interesting, very, very um, uh, uh, thought-provoking issue. To what extent the Islamic hostility toward the West is a sheer religion-based kind of a, uh, a rivalry or hostility? To some extent, it's caused concretely by Western military, economic, political uh, power and uh, the use of that power. That's a real uh, uh, issue. And your earlier question regarding Islam in the Asian region being relatively calm and, uh, uh, and uh, non-belligerent, I think also had uh, points in, in this direction. In fact, you put your finger on a very interesting issue. Uh, President Erdogan of Turkey said in an exclusive interview that I conducted last year, he said so seriously to me, Yang Rei, don't label ISL with Islamic belief. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. They are yeah. not Islamic yeah. faith. Well, thank you very much for being part of this very meaningful dialogue on the alleged clash between different civilizations. Uh, I promise to bring Professor John back for yet another series of discussion about similar issues. Until then, goodbye.